Welcome. On behalf of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, I would like to welcome you to our webinar, Electronics Waste and Human Health, presented by Jim Puckett, Director of the Basal Action Network, and Diana Caballos, PhD, MS, CAIH, with Boston University School of Public Health. A few housekeeping items first. You will be muted during this presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please enter it into the online chat or Q&A. We will be saving time at the end of the presentation to address all of the questions. When you exit the webinar, a link to the evaluation will become available in your browser. You will also receive a follow-up email with a link to the evaluation tomorrow on June 6th. Attendees who have participated in the complete live webinar today with an attentiveness score of 85% or higher will be eligible to receive a certificate of completion. Once you complete this online evaluation, you'll receive your certificate as a PDF within, via email within one week. Sensitiveness scores are calculated by our webinar provider and are based on continuous engagement throughout the presentation. Here are some tips on how to keep your attentiveness score above 85% to earn that certificate of completion. Make sure you join the webinar on time and remain logged in for the entire duration of the presentation. Do not use your device to navigate away from the presentation. If Zoom is not your primary window, your attentiveness level will lower and you are no longer considered fully engaged. For example, checking emails or doing other work on your device continuously lowers that score. So try to keep necessary distractions brief during the presentation. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page and on our website, coeh.berkeley.edu. At this time, we're pleased to welcome our presenters for today. Jim Puckett is the executive director and founder of the Basal Action Network, where he provides strategic oversight and implements and expands their programs. As an activist for over 30 years, his work on toxic waste and toxic waste trade has helped control pollution, safeguard fragile ecosystems from bioaccumulating toxins, protects the world's poor from health hazards, and reuses Earth's limited resources. He has been a chief proponent of just international policies within the United Nations Basel Convention since its inception in 1989, and his assistance was crucial for creating regional waste trade agreements such as the Bakamo Convention, Central American Agreement, Wagana Treaty, and the Cartin Convention Waste Trade Protocol. We're also pleased to introduce Diana Caballos, PhD, MS, and CIH with Boston University School of Public Health. Her research aims to better understand the health effects from exposure to complex mixtures. She is motivated by interdisciplinary and co collaborative research projects to understand and prevent health effects of environmental and occupational contaminants. Dr. Caballos has been doing research with the electronics recycling industry for the last eight years and has published numerous peer-reviewed publications, government reports, trade journal articles, blogs, and conference proceedings related to health and safety in the electronics recycling industry. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. You guys uh, have a unique experience today. Um, you've, got a, you've got an activist of 30 years. You've got a scientist. And uh, I'm going to speak, and then I'm going to hand it over to Diana. She's going to tell you about the formal sector. I'm going to tell you at first about what's happening around the world with this issue. So good afternoon and let's get rolling. Uh, very first thing I wanna say is, oh my God, because we are at an OMG point in history of human beings. It's what I said when I saw this picture uh, taken in Seattle when somebody decided to have the bright idea of having a free take back day for electronics that people didn't want. And a massive university parking lot filled up within hours. We really are in a moment in time where we're all looking at our screens. You get on a train, you see everybody holding something in their palm. It's a very different time than when I was a child and many of you uh, grew up. It's a point where we have gadgets and tools and toys that are remarkable. They do amazing things. We love them. We're addicted to them. Uh, but they have consequences as any major change has consequences.
sources, three different reasons for the growth. The first is what I would call hyperconsumption. So we now have new products like computers and smartphones that we never had in history, and we all want them. And believe me, in the developing world, they want them too, and they're only two or three, four years behind our levels of consumption. So when you think about one country at a time uh, catching up, and now in Africa, they have more phones than we do very often, uh, it's massive consumption that we never saw before of hardware. So here's an example of that uh, with just looking at smartphones from 2007 to 2018 worldwide. Uh, 1.5 billion units uh, sold in 2018, according to this graph. So you can see it's starting to stabilize maybe. Maybe people have enough smartphones, but who knows what the next product will be. So another reason is hyperobsolescence. We've never had a point in history where products of this kind have such a short lifespan. And the lifespans continue, continue to decrease. So remember when we would buy a toaster or a refrigerator, we expected that appliance to last 20 years. Not so with electronic equipment, smartphones, computers, monitors, printers. And here's an example of that. The PCs just from 1992 to 2006 this is the decreasing lifespan. And it didn't always mean that somebody had to, um, you know, that it was broken. It just meant that people wanted the latest thing. So this level of obsolescence is unprecedented. That leads to building this mountain of material I'm talking about. And the final source is proliferation of electronics into all products, including clothing, furniture, etc. The concept of the internet of of everything, of internet of things. This green swath here, below it is the computers and smartphones and tablets, things we're used to with the blue stripes. The green swath is the future of everything having a circuit in it so that it can, it can communicate with the internet and other objects that also have a circuit in them. So it's a massive proliferation of hardware, of electronics, very challenging. So around 300 million computers and a billion cell phones are manufactured every year and expected to grow 8% every year. There are more mobile phones in existence than there are number of people living on Earth. The growth rate of mobile devices compared to the population growth is five times greater. About 22% of the world's mercury is used in electronics. And it's been found that the average US cell phone user replaces his model once every 18 months, despite the worldwide average of the lifespan of the phone actually being around seven years. So when you produce and produce and produce massively and rapidly, and you consume those devices, you are going to rapidly create massive waste. That seems kind of like a no-brainer. It's a very simple equation. But I wish the manufacturers had that in mind when they design things. Because they design things to get them sold. They do not design things for end of life and what to do when they're discarded or obsolete or unwanted. And therein lies the crux of the problem. So we're looking at waste, massive mountains of waste being generated. It's estimated it's about 50 million metric tons of e-waste generated currently this year. 50 million metric tons, what does that mean? So this is one thing it means. It's the equivalent to throwing out 1,000 laptops every single second. Just think about that for a second. <laughs> one single second. 1,000 laptops out the door. And it wouldn't be such a horrible crisis if it were not for the fact that these things are also toxic. And we have groupings of health impacts. Uh, toxic metals is one grouping that's probably the most significant. Although there's also the brominated flame retardants, which also have health impacts. And Diana will talk more about this. And then we have other halogenated hydrocarbons like PVC and PFOAs that are not brominated flame retardants, but other hydrocarbons that have halogens in them. And finally, 
rare earth elements. And there's, I include them here because while some of them might be benign, there's very little data on the rare earth elements and how harmful they might be. So there's significant toxicity. So when we're talking about this mountain of waste, we're really talking about 50 million metric tons of toxic waste generated each year. And to give some idea of what that means, 50 million metric tons of waste is a million metric tons of lead, 3,350 tons of cadmium, and just look, that's global, and looking at the U.S., that would mean we're talking 143,000 metric tons of lead uh, out there being disposed of every year just from this product stream and 214 metric tons of cadmium. Now, I didn't do the math, but you guys might want to do the math after this, but give an idea of the toxicity of cadmium, the US safe drinking water level is 0 0.005 milligrams per liter. When you get 214 metric tons put out into the landscape, what does that mean? So people started and policymakers started realizing, oh my God, we got a problem. Let's not landfill this stuff. It's causing toxicity in the landfills. We have to recycle it. Stuff was never designed to be recycled, really. But recyclers started popping up all over the place. And this is what we experienced in the last 15 years. They're all over your neighborhood. You can find them in the phone book. But what we found is that most of the American recyclers were not recycling at all. They were loading up intermodal containers and shipping the material offshore. And until Ban went and looked and saw what that really looked like, it was out of sight, out of mind. And we tried to bring the sites into people's minds by going to the endpoints and documenting it. I'm going to quickly show you some pictures, a little um, example of how we do our research, and then I'll turn it back over to Diana. But the pictures are hopefully worth a thousand words, and I will be also taking a dipstick with some toxicological studies that have been done at these locations. So the very first report and film we did was in 2002, based on three days we spent in this area of China called Guiyu. And it was the first time Western eyes had really gone and seen what was happening with all this North American and European electronic waste that was being put on container ships and sent there. It was really ground zero for most of the world's e-waste and it was massive what we discovered there. These are some of the occupations that had sprung up. This gentleman is sweeping out toner from toner cartridges and trying to reuse that toner. Very dangerous job. Here people are smashing open cathode ray tubes from the old uh, television monitors, et cetera, and just dumping the glass into the irrigation ditch the exposure here is from the phosphors. And then, of course, the glass has lead in it, which will leach out over time. But the occupational exposure is the phosphors that coat the insides of these uh, CRTs that break open, they implode, and the, and the phosphors come out into their breathing zone. Here's another occupation, a woman cooking circuit boards. This is a huge occupation globally still. It's usually done by women, and they're breathing in the lead tin solder vapors. <clears throat> This gentleman is using acids to strip gold out of chips. So they remove the chips from the, solder, from the desoldering process that you saw previously, and they try to extract some gold using very dangerous acids and washing the residues into the river. These folks are sorting wires to be burned. These wires will be burned at night and to extract the copper. Burning this type of insulation is a toxicological disaster. So some of the findings, uh, immediately people didn't do studies following our research and our investigation, but a guy in the EPA, Mr. Goulet, had this bright idea. He wanted to replicate what we had shown in our film. So he went into the lab and started burning circuit boards and measuring the dioxins, et cetera. He replicated what he, what he saw with our pictures. And he found that lead emission concentrations from burning circuit boards exceeded U.S. municipal incinerator limits by over 200 times. An exceptionally high chlorinated dioxin furin emission level was found, also from the circuit boards. Also, very high brominated dioxin furin emissions were found, and this was anticipated 
and experienced from the conversion of brominated flame retardants. These results health and environmental hazards could result from such rudimentary recycling operations, which is the norm in developing countries. So then we went to Africa, and it's a little bit different market in that most of the exports to Africa were for reuse. And they would take these things into the marketplace and try to fix them and resell them. Not everything could be fixed. A lot of it was dumped. This is in right outside the marketplace. And this also is a picture right outside a Nigerian marketplace. And these type of dumps were thrown into the wetlands and routinely uh, set on fire to reduce the volume. Again, fire and this type of equipment produces some of the most toxic uh, compounds known to people, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, dioxins, which are ends, et cetera. So we went back with 60 Minutes CBS program in 2008 to Guiyu, and things had gotten far worse. Uh, they, are doing a lot, they were doing lots of burning at the time, inside burning houses, where they had workers just setting components on fire and even though there's a fan there and a chimney, they're breathing a lot of this material, the, the solders, the vapors, the dioxins, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, et cetera. And all of this to try to pull out some copper. This is another view of acid stripping operations where the residues again are flushed into a stream which flows to the river. So studies were done after about this time in Guiyu in 2007, a study from uh, Hong Kong Baptist University found lead and road dust 330 to 371 times higher than background sites. Uh, the risk assessment predicted that lead originating from circuit board recycling had a huge potential for serious health risks, especially to children. This woman, Hua Xia, uh, from Shantou University in mainland China, has done enormous amount of work, even finding DNA damage from e-waste. And one of her studies was with the children of the migrant workers, and they had, were found to have lead levels in their blood more than 50% higher than the limit for lead exposure in the U.S. So there's another site that was discovered um, in Ghana, and uh, I include this site because it's famous uh, infamous probably because of the dioxins and the furans created from the burning of equipment. Here you can see the provenance uh, from the U.S. agency of the equipment coming into Ghana. Uh, this is just some of the material that they didn't need to burn, but they're burning most of it. And uh, this is the place where the people live. In the background there you see their homes of the people working in this dump area called Agboboshi. And very recently, just this year, um, a study was done uh, by IPIN, the International Pops Elimination Network, looking at the eggs, free range chickens uh, in this slum area. And the eggs, they found the highest levels ever recorded in eggs of brominated dioxins, second highest level of chlorinated dioxins. 220 fold what the European safety authorities should say should be in eggs. And PCBs were also found in eggs at levels 171 fold the standard. So here in this place, people are eating basically extremely poisonous eggs. Nobody's permitting them from doing that. And it's all from our e-waste. So quickly, I'm gonna tell you about one of our um, projects. <clears throat> We have been trying to find the endpoints of all this export and of course to prevent the export, but it takes uh, good data and most of the trade data is based on people filling out forms. A lot of them are misinformed. They, they misappropriate things and say it's not really e-waste in the customs data. So the data is really shoddy. We wanted a way to really track real e-waste in real time. We settled on using GPS trackers in this project, we used 205 trackers throughout the US and we followed them, placing them into devices and delivering them to recyclers. This was a, a documentary that was done on PBS NewsHour. You can find that uh, by linking to our website, the eTrash Transparency Project. But what we found is that most everything, and this was two and a half years ago, was going to Hong Kong. 
And this is because mainland China had closed their doors to this type of material. They shut down Guiyu, uh, finally. And um, so this area of Hong Kong called New Territories is where 48 of our trackers were able to give us precise locations. These are some of the precise locations where we knew then we needed to get on an airplane and go and see what these really looked like. And that's what we did. These are some of the pictures. Typical printer breakdown. They would just smash the printers. The toner would be flying all over the yard and people would be breathing in the toners. Some of them are probable carcinogens. Uh, this is another huge operation. You can see the workers in the background uh, where they're smashing LCD screens. And this vintage of LCD screens that were being so-called recycled have mercury tubes in them. They have little CCFL backlights that have mercury in each one of them. And these folks had no idea that they were breathing in mercury day in and day out in their breathing zone. These are some of the tubes just tossed on the ground so that the mercury could go into the groundwater. In the workplace, these are the CCFL tubes I'm talking about. <clears throat> also, a lot of the equipment was just dumped because they couldn't recycle it easily. So big piles of equipment was just uh, thrown everywhere and we could have spent a whole new study just looking at things outside of the facilities that were just dumped in this area called New Territories, excuse me. <clears throat> so the key findings of the study is that we found 34% of that which we deployed, including to Goodwill Charities, were going offshore, but of the material we gave over to recyclers, that the customers think are doing the right thing with it, 40% of that was exported. And 96% of it was likely to be illegal in terms of the importing country. So it's illegal to bring this type of material into China. <clears throat> and 93% of it went to developing countries. And finally, the main finding relevant for today's talk is that the workers were ignorant of the hazards and unprotected. So we're very proud to say that after we did this expose with PBS, we also did it in Hong Kong, the news media there, and they have cracked down. So things were shut down in mainland China and now in Hong Kong, I can proudly say as of this year, those junkyard operations that were so numerous uh, are being shut down. There's very few left. So the question is, what's going to happen with this trade? Where will it go next? And we quickly had an answer when we started following our trackers and they started going to Southeast Asia. And uh, some of the trackers, this is where one of them went in Thailand, we followed up and again, very dirty operations and horribly unhygienic for the workers that are paid almost nothing. These are Burmese illegal workers that live in the cardboard shacks you see here on site, on the places they're dealing with the lead and mercury. So here's what we saw undercover when we went in and saw what the workers were dealing with. Uh, here they tried to mask off the solders, but of course they're breathing the cooking circuit boards. And they built a massive incinerator as well, just burning circuit boards to try to get the copper. So they've had some investment here. These are Chinese businessmen that were thwarted in China and have moved down to Thailand. The dioxins went out and there's a, a milk herd out here. Cows are gonna be getting that uh, dioxin into their milk. The government of Thailand, after we notified them, conducted raids, and now Thailand has banned the import of, of e-waste, but who knows where it'll be going next. Diana, I'd like to turn it over to you because this is not just a problem for the developing world. This material is not made to be recycled and it causes problems everywhere. Thank you, Jim. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I'll be talking about formal electronic recycling. And as Jim mentioned, this is the norm in the developed world, but it is starting to happen in, to start to happening also in the developing world. And it usually refers to licensed and permitted facilities that process e-waste indoors with some level of industrial hygiene, worker protection, and pollution control. And common processes found in these facilities, for example, to the circle um, on the right of the diagram, um, obsolete electronics are manually sorted and dismantled. 
often crushed or shredded, separated and taken downstream for a specialized processing or um, even exported uh, or to solid waste. Um, but a lot of the business model had also switched into refurbish, resell, reuse, repurpose. That is the circle to the left. And um, has also even branched into data destruction. And a lot of the electronics are even put apart so that parts of the electronics can be um, sell at a higher retail value. And as you could imagine, um, there are advantages uh, to formalizing electronics recycling, even in the developing world. Limits child labor usually abides by permits and regulations and increases health and safety programs. But even in countries like the United States and Canada, for example, we see enough vulnerable populations because these are still considered dirty jobs. We see a lot of migrant, immigrant, temporary and volunteers. Um, many of the immigrants are recently, you know, arrived to this country, so they have very limited English. Volunteers I've seen from high school volunteers to senior volunteers, and of those that are actually paid, they're usually low wage. Uh, so re these jobs often require low education. Um, a lot of the electronics recycling happens in prisons, and if not in prisons, many of these facilities are actually located near prisons so that they can um, use this labor. And they often hire uh, autistic individuals because they're very efficient and can concentrate and do dismantling of a huge amount of electronics a day. Um, but that means that a lot of uh, potential mental health issues um, in the workers are present. Women are not very common in these workplaces, but they are definitely hired uh, and often in reproductive age. And if many of the workers uh, don't have enough protections, which I'll talk uh, in a minute uh, in more detail, they can definitely take some of this toxic dust into their homes and affect their children. I used to work at CDC NIOSH, and there we did a health and safety survey in the US industry, and we captured our responses from 47 recycling facilities. And we documented that there was a wide variety of electronics process in these facilities, often a small to medium sized facilities, but there were definitely health and safety programs in place, um, but yet, limited knowledge in how to appropriately deal with metal contaminated dust. And this was further verified when we started going into different facilities and there's a series of NIOSH health hazard evaluations um, at the NIOSH website. Of the many controls, sorry, of the many controls that we know are ideal to be found at these facilities, we did um, noted um, that were more common when facilities were larger. And um, this actually agrees with the literature in a small and medium sized enterprises. Um, and from the research that I've done in the industry, um, I published two review papers and we go into reviewing the literature in the formal sector. And in occupational health, uh, most of the studies have been cross-sectional or very focused on exposure assessment and not many actually include several facilities or personal samples. But we can definitely conclude that some of the biggest issues that have been documented are, are metals, flame retardants and polychlorinated biphenyls. Uh, metals, we know there's high inhalation exposures and surface contamination that has been verified by biomonitoring, especially with lead. And then flame retardants, um, high exposures to brominated and chlorinated flame retardants, as well as organophosphate ester flame retardants. And PPDs have definitely been the highest, always recorded since the first study in Sweden by Jodin et al. in 2001 to these days. Um, and of the new flame retardants, I think triphenyl phosphate has been one that has been popping up at highest levels. This is a photo from the NIOSH Health Hazard Evaluations um, doing filter cleaning from a CRT um, processing operation. These are actual prepping that CRTs, depending on the process, um, is done before it's cut. And these also expose workers to high exposures. This is an old uh, angel devil machine that cuts the CRT glass 
into leaded and unleaded glass so that it can be easily processed. And this uh, machine, even though it reduced some of the exposures, it was still high um, risk for the workers. And from the literature, we can definitely verify thus far that some of the high um, exposure um, processes include manual dismantling, shredding, CRT processing, and any other specialized processing like light bulb uh, recycling, uh, and then filter cleaning. We are learning more about flame retardant exposures. When I was still at NIOSH, I started a study on metals and flame retardant exposures that is still continuing. And there are several HHEs that have been published and we're working on some manuscripts. And this study was adopted by Canada and they just recently published a great um, summary of their work by Gravit et al. In, um, some of the high processes, high risk processes are definitely manual dismantling, shredding, and plastics bailing. And one of the things that was so interesting from the Canada study was that the CRT processing was actually a high contributor to flame retardants. And this is important because traditionally we've always thought of lead, phosphorus, cadmium, but flame retardants are also a huge issue. And then they also documented that size of facility was the most important cofactor of exposure. Um, which again, we have better controls, but we have high exposures. From the work that we did at NIOSH, um, because we were assessing dermal exposures to flame retardants on the workers, and we knew that these operations were very dusty, we actually tested a method to do wipes in the hands where we did three sequential wipes to understand how many wipes we actually needed to remove the flame retardants from the hands. And uh, not surprisingly, because these operations are so dusty, we actually often re needed more than one wipe. And because flame retardants have so many types of flame retardants and they have different chemical properties, we actually found that depending on the solubility on the skin, it was easier or harder to remove. And we do know what we need to do to reduce blood levels, even in the formal sector. Um, at a minimum following OSHA LED standard. However, this standard is highly outdated and is not really protective of chronic health issues. And so there's plenty of literature in the occupational medicine literature and the Cal OSHA proposed standard and, and many other um, places that suggest the medical surveillance is the way to go with much lower levels than OSHA states. Um, and thankfully, the certifications, including Jim, have um, adopted these uh, guidelines into the uh, recyclers. Uh, however, because they're not enforceable, they're not always followed to the letter. We also know what to do to reduce air levels, for example, in shredded areas that are a high concern. We should be isolating the area, installing local exhaust ventilation, recirculating air that is not contaminating or putting it to the outside, uh, using respirators. Um, and I do see that many on the, of the big players in the industry here in the United States often have several facilities and usually leave, for example, shredding to one or two only facilities where they can invest more of those controls. And that is encouraging. I also see some players in the industry actually in, in implementing robotics, uh, which will further um, minimize uh, worker personal exposure to, you know, like com extended amount of hours of these exposures. However, there's much that we're yet to understand in terms of finding the right solutions. And besides the issues that are indoors that affect the workers, we know that formal recycling also affects and impacts the health of our environment. There's definitely enough literature to suggest that air, soil, and dust uh, are typically higher in many of the key components of electronics, um, much closer to the facility and, 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 and much higher than compared to reference uh, locations. Um, and these studies have been done in many of the key groups that are of concern for toxicity. We don't have to go very far, but look at the news, even just here in the United States, where we see a lot of abandoned lots full of 
CRTs, um, often in environmental justice communities. We also see a lot of news in terms of uh, facilities that go bankrupt and leave warehouses full of CRTs and there's lawsuits with EPA, with the state, with the city, uh, within companies uh, to try to sort these solid waste and partly why many of the states are actually moving into um, uh, adopting landfilling or CRTs because it has become a huge issue. Other environmental health concerns that comes from formal recycling is that at least has been documented in the literature is that the degree of formalization varies from company to company, but may affect exposures. And, and this is sort of consistent with what we found in occupational health. And um, definitely take home exposures, which is often when a worker is full of dust. And if especially they work in a facility that doesn't have washing facilities, so it doesn't have a uniform, doesn't have a way to change your clothing before you go home, then you are very likely to contaminate your home environment and your family and potentially um, resulting in your family's health issues. In China, there was a study that tracked PCBs from formal facilities all the way to the homes of these workers, suggesting a clear pathway. Um, and then in the United States, um, I was able to help document uh, two children of our recycler that became lead poisoned with the worker just only working at this one of these facilities for only one year. And again, we had shared all of these results with Jim and all the other certifications that have been very proactive into, um, in, you know, disseminating this within the industry. After the Flint um, issue with lead, actually the Huffington Post, I'm sorry, the Huffington Post reached out to me and reached out to the family of the worker that had the two um, lead poisoned children and they did an expose and documented very clearly that these kids only a few years after were already exhibiting the typical symptoms of lead poisoning which are behavioral issues, hyperactivity, learning disabilities and um, it's, it's very disheartening to see that this is uh, really impacting you know families even here in the United States. And this was not surprising because when NIOSH did the health hazard evaluation at this facility, we did document it, that employees um, had lead in on their clothing and on their hands before they went home. And when the health department did the investigation at the home of this family, the father actually only had 25 micrograms per deciliter. So by OSHA standard, he was actually fine yet his children were already 18 and 14 micrograms per deciliter, which are well above action level for public health intervention. And they also confirmed that there were no sources of lead found in the home. To the right, um, it's a colorimetric wipe that turns red in the presence of lead. And these are some of the tools that we use to verify um, surface contamination in these workplaces. And sadly, we also know very well what to do to reduce taken contamination at a minimum follow lead OSHA standard. Uh, however, for the lead standard to be in place in a facility, they actually often have to do measurements and know that they're overexposed. And if they do not know, they often don't have a lead program. Another thing that happens is that they may do the lead program for the highly exposed workers, but not for everyone else. Um, and it's well known in the literature that if there is lead high exposures in a workplace, most workers are affected. Another thing that happens is that if there is training at facilities, even following OSHA lead standard, uh, it is possible that the facilities are not training the workers to protect against taking contaminants home. And so what does it all mean? And what does it mean to health? We are yet to have health studies in the formal sector. This is still a new industry, but from the informal sector, we do have two good reviews uh, that mention some of the health outcomes that have been documented from e-waste that actually agree very well with what is expected based on the toxicity and what is found from electronics. So Grant et al. 2013 um, mentions changes in thyroid function, changes in cellular expression and function, adverse neonatal outcomes, changes in temperament and behavior, and decreased lung function. Yet 
more longitudinal studies are even needed um, in the informal sector. A new review just this year from India, um, which I was actually happy to see because it shows that a lot of new studies are popping up uh, and are documenting more of the acute symptoms that are expected in this industry, which are physical injuries, respiratory issues, the skin and musculoskeletal disorders. <clears throat> And from our reviews, um, and we'll go very briefly through these because there, there would be a lot to talk about, um, but we, we do know what needs to be done. Um, and a lot of these things have been said in the informal sector, but I think they also apply very well for the formal sector, which is we need a new generation of electronics. And even if today electronics were completely, completely safe, we have backlog of decades of all the electronics that need to be recycled safely. And we have a lot of research gaps to be able to fully engage with this workforce in terms of social factors, transport of work to home, health, and then even now that a lot of the e-waste is going to landfill and, and what is happening in the environment. So Jim, it's all yours now. Thank you. Yes, I hate to leave people um, without solutions and we could spend the whole day talking about solutions, but I just wanna give you an overview and, and some further information on our, our certification program that Deanna talked about. So we have uh, worked on international law. Of course, there's the Basel Convention, which focuses in on waste and waste trade. And unfortunately, the United States is not a party to the Basel Convention. So we have tried very hard. Uh, we've done things well in China and in Europe in that regard but we're trying to get something to fill the gap in the United States, which is the most wasteful country per capita in the world, produces the most e-waste, for example. So it's a very important country with respect to this issue. And there is an effort, and you will be hearing more about this in this session, uh, and perhaps next year of Congress, that we have crafted a bill which we think can get Republican support, which is based on the idea of not only environmental concerns, but uh, national security concerns because so much of the e-waste is actually entering the black market, the chips and things that are entering the supply chain of the military and other very sensitive applications. So there is a security issue and uh, we do have another attempt at a U.S. law, but we've so far been thwarted. Um, except when there's a case, uh, as there often is, of recyclers claiming they never export, but they do, and that is fraud and we have been able to prosecute and actually send some of the perpetrators, major exporters to jail uh, very recently. In fact, this year, three executives were sent to jail for exports based on fraud. Um, and we do these reports with the GPS trackers and other means to expose the perpetrators so that the industry knows who's involved in this. And hopefully that will shame people into behaving themselves even in a country where we don't have international law protections to forbid this type of export. And finally, the one I want to tell you more about is because we couldn't get something through legislatively, we turned to the marketplace and created a market strategy, which is a certification of recyclers that do things the ethical and safe way. It's a comprehensive um, standard called eStewards. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, it's, it's quite lengthy and, and very comprehensive because it deals not only with the export issue, but data security, occupational safety and health, et cetera. But if you wanna make sure your equipment is properly recycled, then you will try to seek out an eStewards certified recycler program we have um, created for this purpose. You can find out more about it at e-stewards.org. And you can do this with your own personal waste. Look for an Easter's Recycler. Uh, there's a place on the website where you can find them. And moreover, as an institution, many of you represent universities or organizations, we're always seeking out uh, institutional um, members. And we have what's called an enterprise program. And I've shown some big names here, but we also have universities, cities, and governments as well that are part of this program. And their only um, commitment 
uh, is a significant one, but they're committed to using East Steward certified recyclers as much as possible. So it helps drive the program forward. So it's all about trying to move toward this with a very difficult waste stream and moving away from this. And with that, I would like to close and we'll open it up for questions. Michelle? Wonderful. Thank you guys both so much for this presentation. Um, at this time, we will be opening up the floor to any questions. Um, so if you have a question from the presentation, you're more than welcome to enter it into the chat window or the online Q&A window. I'll be reading them aloud to our presenters. So I'll get started with some of the first questions to come in. Um, one question is regarding if there is a safe way to extract precious metals from PCBs. Um, I can take that one. So PCBs in this case means printed circuit boards uh, and not polychlorinated by phenyls. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, uh, there are smelters. There's about six of them in the world that are extremely high tech, very large copper smelters that have been converted to handling e-waste as well, because e-waste actually, circuit boards particularly, have more value than ore does for things like precious metals and copper. And those, those exist mostly in Europe. There's Boliden and Umicore, for example. There's one in Canada called Glencore. But that's the place where currently the best technology exists. There are some hydrometallurgy operations that are smaller scale that can also do this job. But yeah, it's important to extract the value. One thing that's not well known though is that so much of the e-waste doesn't have a lot of inherent value, particularly now. Um, they're making things with less and less copper, less and less silver, less and less gold. So we have to come up with solutions policy-wise and legislatively that sees this whole job more as a service than a get-rich-quick uh, operation. Excellent, thank you. And we've also had a question if, if perhaps you can expand upon. I know we touched a little bit on um, some per personal protective equipment and other types of controls, um, but I'm curious if you could expand upon some best practices you've seen in formalized e-recycling facilities. I'll let Deanna handle that. Oh, hi. Um, I think that, you know, like, NIOSH usually recommends following, you know, traditional industrial hygiene practices uh, in terms of if there is overexposure, then use a respirator unless ventilation and other controls are going to be reducing the, the hazards. Um, the truth is, you know, even if you follow that, um, because many of these facilities handle lead and other um, toxic materials that are easily, you know, sort of uh, contaminate the whole facility, um, that it's very likely that even when you're not like highly exposed, that you could still be exposed. And so the best, um, you know, in terms of lead, it's to do surveillance, uh, biomonitoring, that, that's the best way, but it, it can be expensive and, 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 and it can be, you know, um, blood blood drones are not very pleasant, but that would be very effective. Um, it, it's done in some of the facilities, not all of the facilities. Um, but following the industrial hygiene hierarchy of controls is the usually best way to go. Wonderful, thank you, Deanna. We also have another question, um, if there have, have been any studies of the long-term health effects to adult and children, either specifically in Guayu, China, um, who are exposed over so many years, and if that could indicate what we might expect to see elsewhere. You know, I don't know of long-term studies. The one that would have the most data that could do that is the woman I showed in the slide from Chantal University, uh, Ms. Shia. She has been doing the studies for the longest period of time. Um, and she has been able to, I mean, she's got people when they were children. So she theoretically should be able to follow those children. But the levels of contamination, the fact that we're dealing with lead, uh, which is developmentally very harmful, uh, there are surely going to be long-term effects, but I'm not sure of, of the studies on that regard. I would agree with Jim. Most of what has been published is cross-sectional or very short term. And I do think that there's a few things that are happening, but uh, some of that is probably going to be, you know, publishing in the next decade. <laughs> 
Wonderful, thank you for sharing. Um, we also have a question regarding flame retardants and where and why they might be a part of um, these types of operations. Um, they're often used as plasticizers uh, or as to reduce the flammability uh, and they're commonly found in many of the plastic casings, also in wires. Um, uh, you know, the, the thing is, many of these electronics also collect a lot of dust because they're like decades old, and a lot of the home dust also has some of the flame retardants. So it, it comes from many different way, you know, sources. Um, but there's a lot of the films and coatings that can also have it. Um, and they're added for many different types of uh, purposes, not just for flame, red, you know, retardant capabilities. Thank you. We also have a few questions that are all alluding to, um, other than the e-stewards, or e-stewards, um, is there another type of electronics waste recycling certification, um, or is there any best ways to know which re recycling centers we can take our e-waste to that it will actually recycle the e-waste instead of shipping it out? Well, of course, we created e-stewards. Um, I didn't go into the history of how he created, but there was an effort to create one standard and it was called R2. And that is a competing certification. R2 does not adopt the Basel Convention definitions nor the Basel Convention prohibitions on export. So that's why we created eStewards. We wanted to have those operators in the US behaving as if the US were a party to the international treaty, which all of Europe is, for example. So we um, insist that e-stewards is the way to go, but there are competing standards out there. Thank you. We also have a question more specifically, um, if, if you could speak to a best procedure for a small company or school district or other smaller organization on a path that they could follow to develop an e-cycle type program. Wow, there's, there's so much education to do on this issue. Yes. <laughs> um, not just science, but design and uh, policy and ethics. And you could take so many different tracks and um, it's a beautiful subject. And also you can do a hands-on uh, investigation. So the kids can find out what is their school board doing with their e-waste? What is their school doing with it when it gets old and obsolete? And there usually are policies at the school level that unfortunately often do the wrong thing because they're a taxpayer funded institution. They're required often to go the cheapest route for disposal and the cheapest route is often the dirtiest route to its export. So it makes a great little investigation uh, as well is to find out what your own school district is doing. And of course you can take computers apart very carefully, learn about them, etc. So a lot can be done. Thank you. Um, we also have another question, um, and thank you everyone for all of these questions. We've got some really great stuff coming in. Um, another question, do you know of any innovative approaches manufacturers are taking to reduce e-waste? Are there any key players in electronics that are taking the lead in this area? Well, um, after we've done our exposés, I think they're getting a, the message um, slow but sure, because as I mentioned in my talk, they do not typically design products for their end of life. And we have horrible examples of putting things into the environment that should never have been produced in the first place. PCBs is one example. Cathode ray tubes, uh, the lead in there and the phosphors, et cetera. Nobody thought when they built a cathode ray tube, what are we gonna do when all of these are obsolete? And we're in that situation now and have been for the last 10 years. And the cathode ray tubes are still causing enormous problems. So the idea is to design things for end of life, design for recycling. And the first and foremost thing you need to do is get the toxicity out of these, this equipment. Find non-toxic alternatives so at least we don't have hazardous waste to deal with. But the companies are getting on board. Um, Apple's trying to phase out all their mercury. Uh, brominated flame retardants are being legislated in, in the EU to remove some of the more hazardous ones from all product lines. And when the EU decides to do something that, that takes the whole global market, adjust to it as well. So there's some countries and companies that have been leaders. Um, Dell and HP have done some good things as well, Samsung also. But they need to move 
quicker and it's never the, the top priority, which it should be. Thank you. And this, this question kind of piggybacks off on that thought. Um, are there any other efforts to hold manufacturers accountable for this waste, such as initiatives to develop products that are more safely, effectively, ineffectively recycled into new electronics? I guess, is there any formulas, form, formula, <laughs> formal uh, efforts to do so? There's two sets of legislation that people are using to address this, and I think we need to do even more. But the first set is to make companies financially responsible and physically in some cases responsible for the end of life of their own equipment. So for example, in certain states in the US, the public can take things back for free and the manufacturers have pooled their money together to uh, satisfy the requirements of safe recycling. Thank you. We also have another question um, regarding any interventions you might be aware of in place that will help. Consumer is doesn't have to pay, um, but the manufacturers are required to take care of their own equipment at end of life. So that has been done. Uh, it's not a universal law in the U.S. by any means, but it is in Europe. And then the other set of legislation is just banning the most hazardous inputs. And there's a legislation in, in the Europe that has done that called the ROHS directive. And we need to do the same all over the world and be more aggressive for the phase outs completely of all use of heavy metals, ruminated flame retardants, et cetera. I once had an expert after a conference, I asked him how quickly, and I asked him this in 2010, I said, how quickly can we have a, a toxic free computer? And he said, 2015, but we have to be pushed. And so we didn't obviously push them hard enough because the experts said it could have been done uh, five years ago, roughly, and we're still not there yet. Thank you. And we have another question about if there are any interventions in place to protect workers who are currently exposed in more informal sectors. Um, for example, in Agloblog Agla Boshi, I said that name terribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can get that name right. It's really hard. Uh, unfortunately, very little is done in this way. Um, and I actually spoke with the woman from Ghana uh, at the Basel Convention meeting a few weeks ago. One of the EPA people from Ghana was there, and I asked her about the eggs. What can we do to keep people from eating these eggs? And she outlined this long bureaucratic procedure, and I thought, oh my God, it's probably not going to happen for years. Um, but they needed to do health studies to have the health uh, ministry involved, et cetera. So meanwhile, people are going to be eating these eggs. Meanwhile, in these the places where I've shown you, Thailand and Hong Kong, et cetera, people are still being exposed to the mercury, and nobody is preventing them from doing that. The best thing that can be done probably is to try to figure out the ways to convert the informal sector to a formal sector. Uh, and the informal sector people are really good at collecting and scavenging material from the dumps, et cetera. And that's not as hazardous as doing the actual operations. So if they could be employed to collect, um, this is a way forward. Thank you. Um, we also have a, a couple more questions. Um, for e-waste that cannot be recycled, is high temperature incineration a good option? And even then, what would be some air emissions and ash hazards? Could these be captured and disposed of? Well, the big debate uh, of landfill versus incineration, I tend to side with uh, not incinerating things, primarily because of the very toxic byproducts that then have to be accounted for and managed as a new waste stream, a new very hazardous waste stream. So we're talking about dioxins and furans that have to be uh, removed and it's never perfect. Uh, so that debate is an endless one, uh, but there's also the issue of incineration tends to lead to, if we start incinerating all our computer plastics, for example, because they have brominated flame retardants and they're difficult to manage and difficult to recycle, uh, we're going to be contributing even more to the climate issue with the carbon footprint being more exacerbated because we'll now be burning plastics as if they were a fossil fuel, which they were derived from. So it's, uh, to me, it's better to have the material in front of you, even if it's long-term storage type of landfilling, where you sequester different types of waste streams that you can come back 
and retrieve later. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and I do have just a couple more questions before, before we end today's webinar. Um, one is kind of a comment followed by a question. Um, someone commented that one of their local recyclers let them know that printers are a big issue because they usually stop working within the year and they've been seeing the number of printers to their business increasing and there aren't that many things to recover from printers. So they're curious if there are any sort of solution that you might be able to identify for printers specifically. Yeah, this is an example of one of the streams that goes offshore because it has very little inherent value. And so to actually take care of it properly will cost you more money than you can make. And this is why they're being exported. And this is, we put GPS trackers and printers and found them ending up all over the world. So this is what speaks to having extended producer responsibility that the manufacturers will have to take this material back and safely recycle it. Of course, they'll add to the, the price of the product to accommodate that, but that's fine. That's called internalizing costs. And that's a good idea. Another way to internalize costs, which we haven't achieved yet, which is what I hope the future will bring, is that we don't own everything, that the manufacturers actually lease the material to the consumers. And in that way, they are stuck with the liabilities of their products at end of life. And so they have a huge incentive if they were leasing it to you rather than selling it to you to make sure they're designed to be recycled and make sure that they're not toxic so there won't be as much cost that they have to deal with them themselves. So it's been some talk at theoretical level of moving to a lease-based economy, but I think it has huge benefits in terms of this type of uh, design concerns that I've been mentioning where people don't have an incentive to design the hazards out of the equipment from the get-go. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much um, to both our presenters and also anyone who joined us for today's webinar. Um, in closing, uh, before I give a closing remarks, I would love to ask both of you if you had some um, additional resources that you could point anyone to for more research, for more information. Um, specifically, someone was curious about uh, investigation centers in Colombia and Latin America, but also if you have any other um, additional resources you'd like our, our engaged participants to, to now direct to following this presentation. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, our two websites, e-stewards.org for the good recyclers, and for our organization, it's ban.org. And you can write me with any specific questions you have, like Colombia or what have you. But if you really want to uh, make a difference, try to get your institution, your organization to get involved with e-stewards at the enterprise and personal level. Thank you. Fiona? Michelle, maybe I'll just share some things with you so when you do the YouTube, you can include. It would be easier. All right, excellent. Yes, and to everyone who joined us today, we will be sending you guys a follow-up email with a link to our evaluation. We'll be posting this video on YouTube so you can reference it later and we'll be sure to include any additional resources um, with those links. Thank you again to both of our presenters today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with us. Um, we host webinars the first Wednesday of every month from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific. We've also launched an online ergonomics webinar series in cooperation with the NIOSH Education and Research Centers throughout the country. These ergonomic webinars take place the third Wednesday of each month. And we hope to see you all back this coming Wednesday, June 19th, for our upcoming NIOSH ergonomics webinar, Large Herd Dairy Milking Parlors, Exposure Characterization and Intervention Analysis with Drs. David Dufrate and Nate Fetke. You can also check out our website for more information and to register for our upcoming events. It's coeh at berkeley.edu. Thank you again for the wonderful questions today, for participation, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Jim. Bye. Bye-bye.